بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Imam Soheb Webb is a contemporary American Muslim educator, activist, and lecturer. His work bridges classical and contemporary Islamic thought, addressing issues of cultural, social, and political relevance to Muslims in the West. After converting to Islam in 1992, Imam Webb left his career in the music industry to pursue his passion in education. He earned a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Central Oklahoma and received intensive private training in the Islamic sciences under a renowned Muslim scholar of Senegalese descent. Imam Webb was hired as the Imam at the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City, where he gave khutbahs, taught religious classes, and provided counseling to families and young people. He also served as an Imam and resident scholar in communities across the United States. From 2004 to 2010, Imam Soheib Webb studied at the world's preeminent Islamic institution of learning, Al-Azhar University in Cairo, in the College of Sharia. During this time, after several years of studying the Arabic language and the Islamic legal tradition, he also served as the head of the English translation department at the Dar al-Ifta al-Misriya. Outside of his studies at Al-Azhar, Soheib Webb completed the memorization of the Qur'an in the city of Mecca, Saudi Arabia. He has been granted numerous traditional teaching licenses, ijazats, adhering to centuries-old Islamic scholarly practice of ensuring the highest standards of scholarship. Imam Webb was named one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center in 2010, and his website, www.sahaibweb.com, was voted the best blog of the year by the 2009 Brass, Brass Crescent Awards. Imam Webb has lectured extensively around the world, including in the Middle East, East Asia, Europe, North Africa, and North America. He currently lives in the Bay Area, where he works with the Muslim American Society and conducts classes in Islamic studies. We're delighted to have him here with us tonight. Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Please join me in welcoming Imam Soheib Webb. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We beseech him and invoke him to send his peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his companions, his family, his community and those who follow him صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم until the end of time uh, Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله it is a great honor and pleasure to be here at this prestigious institution, Zaytuna. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month of Ramadan to uh, give the founders and those who are struggling and working constantly and the institution tawfiq, insha'Allah, to do what is necessary to bring the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will of course involve bringing, insha'Allah, a good understanding of Islam to America. Um, as he said, I'm currently living in the Bay Area. Inshallah, we'll see for how long. But the Bay Area is a, a wonderful place. I'm sure many of you as students have experienced a wide variety of, you know, cultural articulations that s tend to bleed through the Bay Area, if you will. As well as, you know, a lot of other things, hopefully, maybe you haven't told your teachers about. But inshallah, I hope you'll enjoy your time here. This is the month of Ramadan. It's the ninth ye month of the lunar calendar for Muslims. The second year of the Hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, this month was made an obligation for Muslims to fast. And he, وسلم, he came out one day to his companions and he said to them, You know, O people, Qad Faradallahu Alaikum Siyam Ramadan. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the month of Ramadan an obligation upon you. And in the Quran, we find it incredibly articulated. Allah says, Kutiba Alaikum Siyam, which means fasting was a prescription was prescribed for you. As the Imam al haramain I don't know if you studied usul al fiqh yet, but insha'Allah you have Dr. Hatim here who can really give you a nice understanding as well as Imam Yaseen, uh, Dawood Yaseen. You know, kutiba alaykum here means Allah has prescribed for you, so we understand it becomes an obligation. But the word that's used is incredible, kutib, because it's a prescription. 
it's written for you. So what we'll do, we'll just take a few lessons that we can take from the month of Ramadan, um, and then we'll let you go, inshallah, make your adhkar, your dua. This is a good time to be alone before you break your fast. As Imam Ibn Rajib, he said, I fasted the whole dunya and I plan to break my fast in Jannah. So all of this is only a reminder of, of what, you know, what awaits us. And that takes us to, of course, the first goal of Ramadan that everyone knows about is a taqwa And we say that something you arraf bimaqsidihi, or you sharraf bimaqsidihi. Something is honored and something is known by its objective. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest human being ever because his only objective was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he clarifies this in a beautiful way. He says, Subhana ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qabrikum, la'alakum tattaqun. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you, as it was those people before you, so that you can achieve a taqwa. So the goal of Ramadan is taqwa. The word taqwa, since this is an Arabic intensive, and I am very happy to see young American Muslims investing their summer in something besides Jersey Shore. <laughs> it's great to see us investing in Jannah Shore, alhamdulillah. And we, we really should not be too intimidated because we're not Arabs or maybe we're Arabs but we speak ba'ulak a instead of aqulak. That's not an issue. My first teacher as he mentioned was of Senegali descent. He studied, actually his great grandfathers were from the Marabitun. And uh, I remember I used to tell him, but I'm not an Arab, but I'm not an Arab. And he would tell me, and I'm not an Arab, I'm not an Arab, I'm not an Arab. So you can do it, inshallah. As one of the ulama said, He said that Arabic is part of the Islamic religion. It is Islam. And knowing it, according to him, and this is not the strongest opinion, but he has his opinion, um, is an obligation. لِأَنَّ الْقُرْآنَ لَا يُفْهَمُ بِهَا إِلَّا بِهَا Because the Qur'an is not understood except with Arabic. وَمَا لَا يُتِمُ الْوَاجِبِ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبِ And whatever helps us to complete an obligation became an obligation. So this is an incredible effort that we see. And this will not لَا تَأْخُذُهُ سِنَةُ وَلَا نَوْمُ Will not go, inshallah, unnoticed by Al-Kareem Al-Hadi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the goal of the month is taqwa. The word taqwa comes from a word which means a shield. الوقايه and that's why in the Quran we find in surah at-tur wa waqahum rabbuhum adhab al-jahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah protected them he shielded them from a very grievous difficult punishment the word waqahum so the ulama said that a taqwa means to put a shield between yourself and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to put a shield between yourself and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to put a shield between yourself and the potential anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said this shield is made up of three to four important components. Number one is knowledge, knowing something, having ilm. And here we mean knowledge which is beneficial. And that's why we have to commend an effort to create an institution like Zaytuna. Because we live in, in what's now called transmodernity. I'm not sure which modernity we're in, but when one of them, we're moving pretty fast. And you know, it's very similar to what Zuhair said in his poem. He said, you know, about tomorrow, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. This is the whole purpose of postmodernity. And the absence of religious authority. We're not encouraging a priest class, but if we look at Muslims, in particular, if you go online and you see some of the comments or some of the questions, or you see some of the people speaking in the name of Islam who absolutely have no proper credentials. So it became like chaos. And in that time, it's definitely important to reinforce the need for institutions to serve as compasses for Islam in America, to serve as a, 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 a one of the guides that will help people understand their relationship with their religion and understand their relationship with the greater society. So this is an incredible effort. You, you're pioneers. You should feel that you are investing your summer in something far greater than Jersey Shore, as I said earlier. You're investing, insha'Allah, in something that will not be forgotten by those who come later on, insha'Allah. And the word brings with it this understanding of protecting ourselves from haram. And the ulama said there are three types of people when it comes to a taqwa. There are those who are kind of on and off. Those who, at times, they have it, masha'Allah, but at times they don't. The second are those who have taqwa, meaning that they stay away from the haram, and they uh, 
you know, observe the awamir, the orders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, but sometimes they slack off in other areas. Then we have sabiqun bil khayrati bi idnillah, as mentioned in Surah Fatir. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nawara qulubuhum bi ma'rifati iya wa stafahum li ibadati subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who Allah put light in their hearts and those who Allah chose to be his servants. And that's why some ulama said sabiqun bil khayrati bi idnillah humul anbiya. Some of the ulama said those who are first and foremost having this type of relationship with Allah are the prophets. But the majority said no. The majority said no. And these are the people that Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned they are a special type of breed. They are a lucky type of people. And these are the ghuruba that we ask Allah to make us from. The strangers. And these are those who observe the wajib. They observe also the sunan. They observe leaving the makruhat and the muharramat. And also they do not waste their time in the permissible. Fearing that it may cause them to fall into the forbidden. This is their shield. And that's why Abu Darda radiallahu anhu said, nobody will taste true taqwa until he leaves what's permissible, fearing that he may fall into the haram. Now, uh, on an individual level, that's fine. On a social level, I would say before you make that decision, talk to someone who's a mufti. Because here we have ta'arud al-mafasid wal-masalih. Here, sometimes we might have a contradiction between what's harmful and beneficial. And if you make the call on a social level, you could affect all of the Muslims and all of the community in general. But on an individual level, at an ibadah level, that's your personal choice. If you don't want to play Xbox, don't play Xbox. I don't think people here play Xbox. I'm just giving an example. Or whatever, right? But you leave it fearing, I don't want to waste my time. That's why Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala said, some things are not haram, but I act like they're haram because I'm Shafi'i. You know, I'm Imam Shafi'i. I have to set an example and secondly, I don't have time to waste. I don't want to waste my time. So these are people who are very careful even with the permissible. And this means their free time. And that's why Majduddin ibn Taymiyyah, the grandfather of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he used to order his grandson to read books for him while he was in the restroom. The writer of Al-Muntaqa, which was explained by Ash-Shawkani and al Autar. So somebody asked him, how, how can you let someone read books to you, you're in the restroom. He said, I don't want to waste my time. Yeah, so these are people who really know how to invest themselves. In Egypt once, when I was living in Egypt, there was a very beautiful story from one of the Arifin that <clears throat> there was a young woman, she used to live, she was the daughter of one of our mashaykh. And if you've ever been to Egypt, you know it's like, it's like a sardine can, like it's very crowded, it's extremely, extremely crowded. You know, 70 million people now in Cairo, they're saying, right? Absolutely unbelievable, right? It's so crowded when you land here, you hear silence. I know you could hear silence. I landed here, someone told me, you hear that? You hear that? I said, yeah. I said, that's silence. I said, subhanAllah, you're right. So there was a young woman, and one day she turned to her father, and they, they lived, actually, the apartment was the cro across the street, opposite of the house of another sheikh, sheikh of Tasawwuf, yani. And she said one day to her father, hey, what happened to that pole that used to be on the roof? There used to be a pole over there, right? He said, laqad mat the sheikh. He said to her, the sheikh died. It wasn't a pole, he used to be praying all the time, man. So her whole life she thought it was a pole. La yabsit da dar as we say in Egyptian. Yeah? It's a man, it's not a pole, right? Those people who don't waste their time, who don't waste their time. And that's why one of the scholars said, I've met people who are more careful with their time than the banker with his money. And one of them said, who wastes their time? Who wastes their time is worse than someone who, who actually, you know, he dies. So they said, why? He said, because someone who dies, they leave the dunya. But someone who wastes their time, they leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his obedience. And he said, it's worse. So, as students of knowledge, people who want to study, you have to be very careful about your time, how you use your time, how you invest your time, right? And the real student of knowledge is not the one who says, you know what, I'm going to take a break from my studies and chill. I remember once there was a brother, he took him a month to finish Surah A'la with me. My daughter, subhanAllah, memorized Surah A'la in two days, man. This brother took a month 
Of course, in America, you know how it is. So, you know, you come to the class of latte. So I said, bro, it took you a month, man. I mean, you know, bro, I remember I sold the Baqarah in two weeks, man. It took you a month to finish the Ala, you know. You need to be serious. He said, well, I'm just chilling. I said, if you continue to chill like this, you're going to thaw in hell. Right? He got upset with me, but it helped him out. Right? Because as Al-Muhasib, he said, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ مَنْ نَصَحَكْ فَقَدْ أَحَبَّكْ وَمَنْ دَاهَنَكْ فَقَدْ غَشَّكْ Know that the person who advised you, loved you, and the one who flattered you, cheated you. Sometimes you need it, man. Sometimes you need it. So I'm telling you now, you're lucky you're around Imam you know, Dawood, Dr. Hatem, Imam Zaid, Sheikh Hamza. Don't let that be the goal. The goal is not, oh, I was around Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. I got a picture with him. No, no. The goal is to use your time. What they called ikhtimar waqt or ikhtinam bil awqat or istithmar waqt. To use your time. Not making this, the, the actual, you know, being here and around your teachers what you sought. No, what you sought is Allah, and what you sought is what's going to benefit you in the hereafter from knowledge. And that's why Sidi Junaid, the Imam, when he died, someone saw him in a dream after his death, and they asked him, what, like, what helped you? What saved you? Like all the knowledge that you had, all the fiqh, all the masail, all of this. He said, what saved me was two rakah in the night, on a consistent basis. So taqwa for the student of knowledge is not the same as a taqwa for someone who just came back to the deen. And taqwa for the student of knowledge is not the same as the taqwa for someone who's ba'id al-rabbil alameen. The taqwa of the student of knowledge is different than other people. And I know, I know there's a special environment for this type of discussion, but I figured, you know, it's Ramadan, it's the first day, let's go for it, you know, hit full throttle. So number one, as a, as a sincere student of knowledge, Imam Ibn Rajab wrote a very, very, very beautiful risada called Fadlu Ilm al-Salaf ala Ilm al-Khalaf, called the virtues of the, the knowledge of the early scholar, scholars compared to that of the later scholars. And he makes a very good point in there, out of a few, and that is how do you know your knowledge is beneficial? How do you know that what you're learning is really for you, that it's really good for you? And he said, you know, the first sign is that it leads to practice, that it leads you to draw nearer to Allah. That's it, that's the first sign. And that's why some of the Mashaykh in Egypt, I remember we had a Sheikh from Jazair, and we used to read with him five books every morning, after Fajr. And in Fiqh Maliki, Fiqh Shafi, Jama' Jawami, Sharh Muwatta, and some book in Lugha, every day, except Friday. And I remember when we would finish, he would say, go pray to Raqqa. And then I remember one brother was like, this is a bid'ah, you know, this type of individuals, it's a bid'ah. And the Sheikh said, no, 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 you have to do something with your knowledge, do something, at least to Raqqa. If not, go give sadaqah. Do something with it. So when we talk about taqwa in the month of Ramadan, our focus as Muslims should be on practice, especially people of knowledge. Staying away from the forbidden, staying away from the doubtful, that's a give me for a student of knowledge. We don't have to talk about this for people of ilm. But now we're talking about practice, what we've learned. And not making the, the experience the aim. Abdullah ibn Mubarak said something very beautiful. He said, how many people from Khurasan made Hajj, and during Hajj, they were making Riyadh to the people of Khurasan in Afghanistan now. So somebody asked him, how? How could the guy be in Mecca, but he's making Riyadh in his hometown? He said, because why he's in Mecca, he's saying to himself, I wonder what all the people are saying about me, because I'm in Mecca. Sound familiar? Shaitan will come to you, man, everyone, you're with Imam Hamza, you're with Sheikh Zaid, you're at Zaytuna, everyone in the hood is, excuse me, we're at Berkeley, everyone in your, you know, your excellent neighborhood is really praising you, right? You have to be very careful about that, because it will eat away at your sincerity, it will take away from the barakah of the ilm. The second is they said that it has, that the knowledge will be consistent. And that you'll find it even lasting beyond the person's life. Because وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقْ What's with Allah is going to continue. And that's why in the life of Imam Malik, who was just an incredible Imam, someone came to him and said, Ya, uh, oh, oh, Imam Malik, Father Abdullah, there are a number of books now called Muwatta. Many people wrote now, Kuthirat Muwatta. Yani, there's a lot of books called Muwatta. So he says, 
He said to his student, you'll know one day that what I wanted from this book was Allah. Now if you go to any bookstore and you ask for the muwatta of, of any of the previous scholars who came before Malik, people will call the police on you for being insane. It's the only one that stood the test of time. So they say that it will last, it will have barakah, it will have khair, you'll see it. And that's why Imam Ibn al Skandari said, Man ashraqat nihayatuhu faqad ashraqat bidayatuhu. Whoever their, 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 their ending was illuminated, it was because their beginning was illuminated. And he said, وَمِنْ عَرَمَاتِ النَّجَاحِ فِي النِّهَايَةِ الرُّجُوعِ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الْبِدَايَةِ That the sign of a successful ending is returning to Allah in the beginning. So this taqwa. And this month trains us on taqwa. And we all know the beautiful story of how Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu, when Umar asked him, what's taqwa? He said, have you ever gone to like a thorny path with like these kind of clothes on, right? He said, yeah. He said, how did you carry yourself? He said, I pulled my clothes around myself and I walked very carefully. He said, dhaqa taqwa. He said to him, this is taqwa. This is the meaning of taqwa, to be careful of these things. One of the universal lessons we take from the month of Ramadan, because we don't have much time, but something I have been giving a lot of thought to, especially in an age where it's extremely, in, in, this existence is very introverted now. Everyone's about expressing themselves. When you couple that with the fact that we live in California, I'm originally from Oklahoma. I'm not saying this to diss anyone from California, but this is the most self-absorbed society I've ever seen in my life. People are inebriated with themselves. Like everywhere you go, people are dressed like they're at the red carpet. Even the gym. You go to 24-hour fitna, and you find, you find people there dressed as though it's like, hey, I'm in a club. It's like, you're wrong club. It's a gym. Right? You go to Oklahoma, they got like baggy sweats on and like old tennis shoes. and you know, Nobody cares. And then I have like tattoos that say like, I am human. You know, stuff like that. It's a very, very extroverted reality. And I'm not saying that to diss anyone, but scholars of Islam and social scholars, and this is why I, I encourage Muslims always to go into social sciences. Yeah, to understand patterns and trends in society and see how Islam answers these questions in a way that brings benefit to people, right? But here it becomes extremely, extremely important to have a break to really look into ourselves to run like a virus check on the soul. So we come into a 30 day period, 29 or 30 day period, where the focus is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the focus is on our own mistakes. And that's why the scholar said, man yakshif lahu, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed or uncovered for that person, their uyub, then Allah laqad manna Allahu alayhi. Then this is a favor of Allah. And that's why, in, at least in Egypt, some of our mashaykh of the qulub, they say, maqam al-kashf, the station where Allah lifts the veils from your eyes and you see the crap that you do. And that's the best way to say it, right? You see who you are. And then you say, man, I got issues. How many of us are converts here? Anyone? Right? How did we convert when we realized what? We had serious problems, right or wrong? The veils were lifted and we said, man, how am I living my life? So that's why one of the scholars said, how many mistakes led people to paradise? Yeah. So in this month, taking that time to look into ourselves, because one of the universals of this month is that it reminds us of the hereafter. Think about it. Everything is built into Islam to remind you of the meeting with Allah. Because Islam came for one sole purpose, to bring benefit and prevent harm. That's it. Jabal Musari wa Mufasid. And the Prophet said, The Prophet said, Remember, call to remembrance that thing that will destroy pleasures, death. Right? And the dunya, the fundamental principle of this dunya is to invite you to its stability, which is a lie. Everything is going to perish. But the dunya tells you, No, consume, consume, immerse yourself in me. Trust me, I'm like Linus's blanket. Trust me, be secure. Don't worry. So it deceives people. It deceives you. And look at young women, I encourage you to read a book called Branded. Have any of you read this book? Wow, man, read that book. The marketing, 
that's used to make every single one of you think you're ugly, you're not physically fit, you have problems, you need to be concerned about yourselves. A sister came to me and said, Imam, you have Qiyam al-Layl, I have Qiyam al-Mira'a. I stood in front of the mirror, I was, I was up on it and I cried because I don't look right. I said, SubhanAllah, manufactured beauty. And that's why they call it your foundation. Even the terminology is slick. Do you wash your foundation away with water? Or do you wash your foundation away with toba? So there, there's a, a, a definite focus on undermining the stability of young women in a society. And then coming to the, with a left hook or right hook with feminism. And next thing you know, you, what happened? Right? Because the dunya is not stable. But it lies to us and constantly encourages us to think you're going to be here forever. Same with brothers. Every brother I know is worried about a six pack now. Brother ain't got a two liter yet. Worried about a six pack. <laughs> Sits in front of the mirror. <clears throat> Dink. Alhamdulillah. I got one can. One can. Right? That, but that's not, that's not. Anyways. Yeah. And if you go to the gym, I work out. What do people at the gym do the most? What do they do? Look in the mirror the whole time. It's like, brother, you didn't change from the last set to the next set, dude. It's not going to happen like that. But the idea of chasing, becoming durables for the dunya. I understand this is an academic institution, but I, I tend to keep it a little different. Sorry. Right. But the idea that this place is stable. Where Ramadan and Islam invites us to be complete, comfortable people. Completely comfortable. That's why the word personality in Greek means what? It means a mask. People mask themselves because they're insecure. Man, there's, there's no security like meeting this brother right here and just being brothers, man. Not having a front. We used to call it fronting. I'm fronting. Right? Still call it, I'm fronting. Because what does that mean? I'm a hypocrite. That's what it means. And the prophet said, the worst are people who have two tongues and two faces. So the dunya creates that instability and we, we make ourselves stable because the dunya is a lie by living vicariously through lies. And that's what happens. And we, we even see people start to act and talk like other people. A sister came to me and said, I follow the Kardashians. I said, I follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, but there's, I don't know. I said, what do they make you feel like? I said, honestly. Break it down, sis. You can do it. I became like Dr. Drew. I said, you can do it. She said, they make me feel like garbage. But then I want to be like them, so I won't feel like that more. You know, they're saying now, studies show that when people go on Facebook, right, their brain, their brain emits the same chemical that comes out of a crack addict's head when they get ready to hit the pipe. What does it tell you about the dunya? People who are addicted to pornography have shown the same symptoms of people who are addicted to high-powered drugs. What does it tell you? That the dunya, its job is to make you completely unstable. Look at the white iPad or the white iPhone. I have a white iPad because that's the one I bought. Right? But there was a brother who told me, he said, Wallahi, man, I have to go, I have to go with the white one. He's like, but you got, you got one right there. It's black, it's cool. He's like, no, no, but the white one is so much better. It's like, no, you're just, they're just going to take it and change the plastic on the outside. It's going to be the same machine. It's like, no. He had like a dunyagasm, excuse me. And I said to him, Akhi, I said to him, Akhi, Akhi, I'm going to tell you what Omar, he said to a man once. Once Omar was walking down the streets of Medina, he saw this man running. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to eat my favorite food. He grabbed him and said, does the believer obey his soul like this? Like, check yourself, man. Right? So we're being invited to the instability of this world. And the more people become immer immersed in this dunya, the more unstable they are. Look at it. Those of you who play black ops, you look like a black, black ops crowd, of course. You know, there's a, Shaitan has a kill streak of about 20. It started with Marilyn Monroe and it's ending with Lindsay Lohan. How many of these incredibly well-off, famous people are we seeing, you know, basically getting blasted by shaitan? Michael Jackson, dude, you got an elephant in your backyard, bro. You have a, a Ferris wheel in your living room. What else do you want? 
right? But it shows you the more invested you are in this dunya, the more unstable you become. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? And that's why the scholars of mantiq, when they talked about ilm and tasawwur, what do they say is jahil? Tasawwur shay ala ghayr haqiqatihi. To think about something and to perceive it as something that is not. This is ignorance. And knowledge is to perceive something as it really is as best you can. So people who have immersed themselves in this dunya have immersed themselves in a lie. And they're getting played like a piano on Sunday school. For real. And that's why they're not stable. Those who became Muslim, the stability that you had when you became Muslim cannot compare to anything else that you had. That's why Salman al-Farisi, he changed his name to Salman ibn Islam. He said, but Islam is not your father. He said, but Islam raised me. So this dunya is calling us to be people who are completely insecure with themselves. And we're seeing now, a'udhu billah, in the American Muslim community, sisters with anorexia, man. I got a question. After I have iftar, can I go and make myself throw up? That won't break my fast, right? I got this question. Do you think I'm dumb enough, sister, to say, no, it won't break your fast? Or do you think I said, in the American context, no, it won't. Why don't you come see me? We need to talk. You got some issues. So we are being called to stability. And fasting makes us to be complete human beings. And the instability of the dunya is a systemic issue that permeates our community. Brothers are being constantly told, the harder you are, the more of a man you are. A brother came and told me, I'm hard, Aki. He told me, I don't know how to be romantic with my wife. I told him, Aki, you're not normal. He said, no, because I'm hard. I said, are you hard, like hardcore? So I'm hard. I said, ثُمَّ قَصَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ أَمَشَّتُ قَصْوَةِ Their hearts became hard. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to be away from Allah. And the farthest heart from Allah is the hardest heart, even the terminology. And how brothers are being pounded with the idea of self-gratitude. To be a, a person who's just concerned about yourself. And that's why we find brothers, I don't want to get married. I, why? Man, I got a 52-inch TV, dude. That's qiyas al fariq ya mawlana. What does a 52-inch TV have to do with marriage? Man, I don't want to give it up, man. Vice versa also. So we have to be very careful. So we take from the month of Ramadan the reminder of the Akhirah and something totally incredible. It's so Quranic, it's so amazing that one of the scholars said, you will not find a page of Quran except the hereafter is mentioned on it. So you start, Surah Al-Fatiha, Maliki Yawm Al-Din. The next page, Wahum bil Akhiratihum Yuqinun. The next page, Walahum Adabun Alimun. The next page, Waqudu Hannasu Wal Hijara. Hellfire. The next page. وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّةِ We can go, 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 go. Every page in Quran, the hereafter is being mentioned. Why? Because calling to mind the reality of death in the hereafter is one of the greatest quick ways to fix people and bring them close to what's really beneficial for them. And that's why Ash-Shatibi rahimahullah in al muwaffaqat in the fifth volume, actually the first volume, he talks about how the Prophet ﷺ does not waste time on things that don't cause people to change and become better. So when Jibreel السلام, asked him, The one asking about the hour knows no more than the one he's asking. I don't know. But then when he asked him, Tell me about you know, the signs of the hereafter, the Prophet goes into great detail. So Ash-Shatibi, this incredible jurist who died 791 after Hijri, he said, this is a proof that Islam seeks to bring what's beneficial and prevent people from harm. The Prophet answers when it comes to this. When someone asks him, مَتَى سَاعَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ مَا عَدَّتْ تَلَهَا When's the hour? He said, what did you prepare for? Right? So now the remembrance of the hereafter causes all of us to ping, get in check. That's why when I teach the Bab on Janazah, in fiqh maliki, you know what I do? We actually do it. Every one of the students gets wrapped up. We put you in a box. We go on for a walk with you. We put you in, a, in, a, in the box, man. And we might drop you off somewhere. Not Walmart. <laughs> yeah. And you see the brothers, man. They, oh, man, it's going to be cool. I can't wait. Then you start wrapping that cloth around him. He's like, Mama. <laughs> what happened, man? What happened to you, Achi? 
You went from being brave heart to you know, scary heart. The other lesson that we take in this month is how it brings this re remembrance of the hereafter in just an incredible way. We stand in our prayers because we're reminded that we're going to stand in front of Allah. We fast the entire day. We're called sa'ih in the Quran, the one who travels for long distances. And the longer the day is, the Sahabi used to love longer days for fasting. They didn't complain because it reminded them of Yawm al-Hashr. It reminded them on a day when we're going to stand and the sun is going to be very close to our heads. And we're going to be sweating. And we know that the famous hadith says, Saba'a yadhirmu law fi dhili yawm al al But there's other hadith that talk about those seven people, more than the seven, who are going to be in the shade of Allah. And that day we ask Allah to make us from them. Right, we ask Allah to make us from them. We're encouraged to give sadaqah, to free ourselves from being connected to this dunya. We're encouraged to, to increase our ibadah. The more we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the easier it is to fast. What I've noticed, the people who sleep all day, or half the day, and just you know, pray enough to get by, these are the people who complain the most. But people who are busy in ibadah, busy in dhikr, busy in their work, busy with their families, busy with some type of ibadah, then I find the fasting goes easier for them. Easier for them. Another lesson we take from the month of Ramadan uh, is the idea of how Islam brings and makes things easy for us. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ يُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ مَعْسْرِ Allah wants ease for you, He doesn't want harm for you. And Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفْ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِفَ And that's why those verses about fasting the entire edifice of usul of fiqh is found in these verses. It's absolutely incredible. Everything is there. You could teach usul from those verses. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies the mushakka. We have this beautiful axiom, al mushakka tajlibu taysir. That hardship warrants ease. And the ulama, they said, the hardships as identified by sharia are the following. Number one, fear. Someone scared, legitimately scared. Ta'wil, qareeb, laysa al ba'id. Legitimately scared. Number two, someone is sick. Someone's ill. What do we mean by, what do we mean by mushakka? That the rukhsa comes into play, that the ease, the dispensation comes in. So, for example, someone who cannot stand, can they pray sitting? So the ruling changes for them. And then that mushakka tajibu tisir. Hardship makes ease. Hardship makes ease. A chef, he said it in another way in the Risada. He said, if things become tight, Islam expands them for people. It's a very beautiful word. Very beautiful word for them. So fear, sickness, traveling is another one. People are traveling. Islam makes it easy for them. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفْ عَنْكُمْ وَيَدْعُ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَاهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah says about the Prophet that he lifted the chains from the people. He removed the shackles from them. Because the Sharia, before the Sharia of Muhammad is a Sharia that has a lot of isr, a lot of difficulty. And we'll get to this in a minute as we finish. How do we talk about Sharia to the American society on a greater level? We can take something from Ramadan. We can take something from Ramadan to share with others because it's crucial now to articulate these things to people. At a higher level, at a more dignified academic level, in the, in the world of academia, yes. But even in the streets, even with the common people, how do we communicate to them? So we'll talk about that, inshallah. The other is al-kathra. Something is so much, so abundant, you can't escape it. It's hard. So Islam changes the ruling for you, to make it easy for you. And the last is al-qillah, something that's so insignificant. That's why al-qarafi, uh, the great Madiki jurist, he said, for example, if someone has a small, small release of something najis on their clothing and they pray, their salah is maqbula. Why? Ashan al Something which is not concerned. But let me break this down for you in a really cool way, sisters and brothers, um, in the month of Ramadan. So, how does this work? How do we apply this axiom? The majority of ulama said, qiyas bil mushaqqat laysa jaizan. That it's not allowed to make qiyas with these things. But thank God for the Shafi method, alhamdulillah, who allowed us to. Right? And this is the opinion of Al-Azhar al-Sharif, by the way, that they allowed us when we were studying ifta and dar ifta. And that's important because you're dealing with human beings. When you study in an environment, hopefully here it's a little different because you got people from, you know, mashallah, the hood, but, and the academic hood also. But 
what happens a lot of times is our brothers and sisters go overseas and become extremely literate in speaking to the four corners of Khalil and, and absolutely impoverished when it comes to speaking to the four corners of the globe. So what's the benefit of what you studied? I remember once I was in Ezhar, I met a convert brother. He told me, my entire goal in life is to destroy the Sufis. I said, bro, you're in the wrong country. <laughs> so one thing. And Masjid of Hussein is right behind us, you know. He said, no, this is, my to this is what I want to do. I said, really? I said, Akhi, where are you from? He said, I'm from Brooklyn, Fort Greene. I mean, this is incredible. This is where jay Z's from, right? So Marcy, now it's called Marcy. So I said to him, how many languages do you speak besides Arabic? So I, speak, I speak, you know, two. I speak English and I speak Spanish. And then now I've learned Arabic. So I said, out of all the things you've learned here, whoever you're studying with, don't you think there's maybe something more important than that? Like translating books in Spanish, maybe going back to school and getting a PhD, maybe contributing to Islam in America? He said, no, this is what I want to do. I want to fight Ahlul Bidah. So I said to him what I said to you now. Bro, you're not able to live outside of the four books, the four corners of your book. You're going to absolutely do nothing for it. You're not going to do anything for anyone, bro. You have to be relevant to the people. My first day in Dar Ifta, a woman came into Masjid al Azhar who committed zina. So I just came out of school. I was gassed up. I've been reading all my books and, you know, Faraidu wudu isabatun wahid al wa faru niyatun fi badi. I was excited. I was pumped. So she came in Masjid Azhar. And she's like, you know, and this sadiq waqat fi haga ma rago. You know, the same line. I have a friend and she did this. I was like, she did what? I was trying to be Mr. Sheikh. Right? And she was like, I was like, La Yeah, just answer the question. She's like, Yeah, well, you know, darao. Right? You know, something happened. So I was like, La hawla wa la I start going off, right? There was a Sheikh Muhammad Saad, Taban, Muhammad Saad always in Egypt, it's a Muhammad Saad. Muhammad Saad from Mansoura. He said to me, honestly, he said to me, shut up. Yeah, he told me, shut up, man. In the waraq of al-azhar. I was like, well, okay, well, fine. He had the red hat on, so I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Mr. Red Hat. Then he came to me, he said, uh, brother, is this your first day here? First week? First day? I said, this is my first hour. He's like, yeah, that's what I thought. Go sit on it, be quiet. <laughs> Then he answered her question, she started crying, you know, and then and he helped her out. And then he asked her, were you raped? Were you sexually abused? You know, did someone harm you? Were you forced into it? You know, just don't say what you did, but just say no to those questions. Because if that's the case, I need to find someone that can help you. That's a sheikh. Then she left and he said, Aki, Aki, come here, come here. He said, I want to invite you to my home for mashi. When an Egyptian says that, I mean, you did something really wrong. <laughs> so I said, fine. He said, brother... He said, you know, in Ezhar, you're good at studying books. But the blood in those books is cold and blue. Here, the blood in the books that I read is red and warm. So different. Has a different taste, yeah. So Islam gives us this mushaqat, helps us to be relevant so that we can have a role to play even in American society. We talk about that religiously in a secular world, here comes a religion which seeks to ease a relationship with God and to facilitate your ability to feel confident in yourself. Islam is not a religion that bases itself on making people feel dominated, but it empowers people to transcend the evils of their souls. You don't think that's relevant? Ask us. To people now? So, we say in the month of Ramadan, why doesn't a woman have to make up her prayers? Because of kathra. It's a mushakka. But why do you have to make up the fasting? How many times do you pray in a day? Five. How many times do you fast in a day? Once. Maybe when someone say, well, that's fart and that's fart. How come I got to do that one and I got to do this one? Right? Or, you know, excuse me, why do I have to perform this one and not that one? Right? With a comma. We'll say to them, because the first yasit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re recognizes for us and identifies for us that it's an abundance, it's hard on you to make up five prayers every day. So, 
but fasting is only once a day, so it's easy for you to make it up. That's how it works. Then you see, wow, oh, subhanAllah, you see the rahmah of Allah. One of the students I had, we studied together, usul of fiqh, and I asked him, what did you learn from usul of fiqh? He said, rahmah. I learned Allah's mercy. I said, subhanAllah, I was going to say some big, you know, legal answer about qiyas al-ilal and all this stuff, and the guy gave this rahmah. The last lesson that we take as American Muslims, very crucial for us here, um, is that we should be able to take these incredible principles found in Qur'an. We should understand them, and we need literacy. If we're to look at, you know, if we take like, for example, Bloom's taxonomy, right, and we apply it to Islamic studies in America, for the most part, we're not anywhere up past one or two. Right? In fact, some of the madaris are still at rote learning, just memorizing everything. Just regurgitating everything. You know, Al-Qarafi said that, you know, regurgitating books is dhalum mudil. Because these books, many of them, most of the masail, in fact, fiqhiyah, were written in order to achieve the maslaha for the people that they lived amongst. Now in America, if we're going to translate a book of fiqh, I don't think we should begin, Ya Mawlana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, with, you know, the had and the discussion about what is the had, is it jami' mani', is it, you know, this, is it that. Is it allowed to use al in the ta'rif? That doesn't apply to anyone in America anymore. And that's why for the Madikis, we love the Risal of Abi Zayl al-Qairawani. Why? Because it was written before that age. You know, I mean, he just starts. He says, Yajib ala al-Mukallaf. He doesn't say, Amma al-Wudu'u, Faman wada' wudu'u, wa 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 ikhtilaf bayna hadha wa hadha wa al-Hashi ala al-Hashi ala al-Hashi ala al-Hashi. One of the Mashaykh, he said, one of the Mutum we found in Egypt had more than 44 Hashi on it. 44 mega commentaries on one text in one, like, one series. No one can study like that now. So we learn from the month of Ramadan, we take these import important universal principles, being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being faithful to Allah, observing this triangular uh, uh, approach towards religion of the mind, the heart, and the body. And we should be able to gain literacy of this, not simply rote learning. How many people have you met? I'm sure Dr. Hatem. I've met them. In Egypt, we had this brother who memorized the Khalil, memorized the Muatta, and memorized uh, um, the Alfiya. So I remember one day, we're in class, and he said to the Sheikh, uh, Then the Sheikh said, Good, what does that mean? He said, I don't know. I don't know what it means. He said, Then why did you memorize it? Yeah. Of course, we need to memorize, as Dr. Hijazi, who made us memorize the Alfiya, encourages from Imbaba, memorize but understand. So now, in the American Muslim context, we have to appreciate efforts of places like Zaytuna, who are trying to raise the level of you know, the discourse amongst Muslims in America, and have enough guts to invite non-Muslims to speak here, which I've seen a number of times, alhamdulillah, intellectuals outside of just the standard Islamic, you know, core, right? That will help us to look at our religion in a brighter way, to gain synthesis, as he talks about Maslow. That how can we speak to a populist if we don't know how to, you don't even understand what's going on in their world. It's not possible. It's not possible that Islam is going to become deeply rooted in America if we don't speak to the problems and the solutions of America through our religion. Look at Casey Anthony, the Casey Anthony trial. Look at what happened in New York with the sexting fiasco. How many op-eds were written by imams in America? How many op-eds were written by rabbis? How many Christians took the time? Christian Smith, he's a genius, wrote this book, Souls in Transition, about young uh, evangelical Christians and their struggle with faith. Right? That's where we need to be as Muslims. But in order to do that, we have to have a basic understanding of Islam, literacy, and then a good understanding of the society that we live in, and then we'll be able to speak to people, have a multidisciplinary approach to Islamic studies. Believe me, Al-Azhar cannot handle America. Saudi Arabia cannot handle America. Damascus cannot handle America. Mauritania and Yemen cannot handle America. But if we can merge them together, right, we can then really serve people in a much better way. And that's why one of my friends who graduated from Azhar when he came back to America, he said, I learned more in the first year that I did in Azhar. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, I applied everything. Like I had to struggle with that application. I'm an educator, so I'm looking at it, of course, from Maslow's 
hierarchy of needs, which is absolutely incredible. It's very beneficial. And if we were to take most Islamic studies curriculum in the world and take the verbs that Abraham Maslow talked about in his hierarchy of needs, most of them will still be at the first to second level. Which means they're not able to speak to society. And we see that even in the Muslim world, where the gulf between secularism, which is a salient, subliminal secularism, and religion is slowly growing, not necessarily because of the aggressive nature of secularism, but because of the inability of religion to speak to people now. And that's a big, big issue that we have to deal with. So I want to encourage you. I know I'm, I'm on a tangent, so all good. It's Ramadan. I'm fasting. You know how it is. But Imam Ibn Qayyim said something I want you to remember. And that is, he said, there are two things you need to really be a mufti. This is what I study. I'm sorry. It's always end up going down this track. Forgive me. But actually the word ifta means to make something clear that was ambiguous. That's what we call young people fitya. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِيدْنَمْ هُدَى Because we didn't know who they were. You know, they were little kids. We're like, what's he going to look like when he gets older? I'll make dua. And then, <laughs> bam! Oh, alhamdulillah. It's Brad Pitt with a turban. Mashallah. <laughs> I never would have guessed. This is called fitya. Because what was fihi gumud now became very clear. So the mufti always, usually, as we study, answers questions where there is like, you know, it's not clear, man. It's gray matter there. Right? And... He said something profound, and I'll finish. And he said that the mufti has to have two qualities to function. And this is very relevant for America. Ma'rifatul deen wa ma'rifatul nas. He has to know the religion and he has to know the people. Where, where, what books of sociology can imams read that are written by Muslim academics? That can really help them understand the problems of young Muslim, American Muslims. You know, really, read that book by Christian Smith. Christian Smith wrote two incredible books. One of them is called Souls in Transition. He's a gifted scholar of religion, but he's also, also a gifted sociologist. He actually went into the streets and started asking young evangelical Christian kids, how do you feel about church? How do you relate with a preacher? Does the message work for you? Why doesn't it work for you? And he wrote an entire book about it. Right? Frank Luntz, you know, we have definitely our differences with Dr. Frank Luntz, right? But read what Americans think, really. As an imam, I have benefited tremendously from that book. Why? Because it tells you about American people, what they're up to. 60% 60, 60 of Americans are up before Fajr. That's a good quality. You tell that Muslim, he's like, I don't understand why we're in this situation. Well, 60% of us can't wake up for Akhira. 60% of them can wake up for Dunya. That's the difference. So... I would encourage you, and that's why I honestly, my teacher encouraged me to go get a degree first from a Western institution. And I believe that one of the conditions of an imam in America is that they should have a degree from a Western institution. Right? And then go and study overseas. And Dr. Sherman Jackson told me, when you go study overseas, study like this, with one eye open. And don't be scared to be constructively critical. Just because we say the word tradition doesn't mean esma. And there are things that we have to engage as Muslims in America, right? When we're forging an identity in this month of Ramadan, of course, right? Keeping it relevant, right? Forging an identity to be respectable and efficient and beneficial to the people around us. So Ibn Qayyim gives a good example, and I'm sorry, it might be a little rough. You find it in Sahih Bukhari, when the Prophet ﷺ told Ali ibn Abu Talib salam, go and intercept this woman in the desert who has military secrets of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa so he went to her. It's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Hadith Sahih. You probably read it and said, what is going on here? Because Ali gets a little ghetto. Yeah, he does. He comes to her and he says, hey, uh, give me the secrets. And she is like, and of course the translation does not do it justice. We have the English translation might be full and protein based when it comes to vocabulary, but the emotion and the meaning is anorexic. Because we'll translate, oh, pardon me, I don't have any papers with me at all. <laughs> but that's not, she's like, I got no papers. That's the feeling, right? And then he said to her, yeah, you do, give me the papers, right? And then she said, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just an innocent Bedouin Arab woman traversing, you know, the desert all by myself. Hello. So then he said to her, if you don't give me those papers, I'm going to rip your clothes off and take them. It's in Bukhari. You might say, oh God. But see, you can't be more pious than the Sahaba. That's one thing as Muslims in America, we have to be very careful. The Sahaba were so comfortable with the religion. 
and so aware of the futility of this dunya that they could keep it real. So when he said that, what do you think she did? Hello. Right? Ibn Qayyim said, this is the art of a mufti. He said he knows, he said first of all he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. Right? But he knows how to speak to his people. What's the worst thing you could tell a Bedouin woman, right? In the desert. Don't ask me about human rights and stuff, man. I'm just, it's out of sabil and misal. It's that. He said, that's the example of someone, I'm not telling you go do this, of someone who knows his people. He's able to speak to his people. He's able to communicate in a language that the people understand, not in a foreign language. So this Zaytuna is an incredible opportunity to learn how to synthesize the tradition, to bridge it with what's happening now in this age of ours. Because without tra tradition, we become like Chicken George and things just become completely chaotic. So the tradition is definitely an important compass, it's a GPS. But at the same time, people like Sheikh Hamza, people like Sheikh Zaid, people like Imam Dawood, people like Dr. Hatim, understand that Islamic studies has gone through some very serious problems in the past, especially over the last 150 years, 200 years, and even prior to that, and that there are some things that you're going to have to have enough bravery and strength to go it alone and test the waters a little bit. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this month of Ramadan. There's a few things you should do quickly. Number one is always check your intention during the month. Number two is increase your discussions about the hereafter. Decrease your discussions about this dunya, unless you have to at work or whatever. Don't go to Cisco and say, you know, I'm not allowed to talk about dunya. It's not going to work, right? Number three, try to fix any problems you have with your families. That's incredibly important. People, I'm shocked that the Muslim community haven't spoken to their children for 10 years. And they think it's great. Because why? He married a white girl. We're going to speak to him now. <laughs> Brother, uh, hello. He's, no, you're not white. You're an imam. <laughs> it's like the rhetoric has blinded him. Right? I'm still white. I just happen to be a white imam. Right? So fix the problems in your family. Call your parents. Tell them you love them. There's barakah. When I started memorizing Quran, I could memorize half a page. I went to the sheikh to complain. He said, how's your relationship with your mom? I was like, dude, she's a kafir, dude. Who cares, man? Even Taymiyyah said, in, you know, al wasatiyah these people are going to hell, man. That was hardcore. My pants were up there. And he told me, he said, no, no. And then I, every time I'd come, I remember I finished memorizing this from the Quran. How's your mother? Finally, I said, why do you keep asking about my mother? He's like, listen, you know why you can't memorize? Because you have a problem with your parents. It's like, you need to go fix this problem. When I fix that problem, subhanAllah, four pages a day. Yeah. So there's barakah in the family, the aqarib, your neighbors. Also, we should take this time to invite our non-Muslim buddies, man, our neighbors, our friends, right, to participate in our homes. And if they invite us to go to the church, go, right? But we should take this opportunity to share. Li ta'arafu, li ta'arafu, li ta'arafu. Finally, we should try to have three important things. Knowledge, ibadah, and activism. These are the three components that we find in the month of Ramadan. We see what's happening in the world now. We see the human rights of people in Syria being violated in a way which is absolutely un indescribable. As Muslims, we should not neglect these things. We cannot neglect these kind of things we see around us. May Allah bless this important institution, bless you, and make your, inshallah, siyam uh, totally filled with barakah. We ask him, bi jirari Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to unite us with him sallallahu kama amana bihi wa lam narahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa jazakallahu khair thank you very much assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah